Uh, I'd like to start by um, when you say rights, right? So if I if I were to ask you, let's say there was a wolf walking through the woods and then it saw a, like a, a stream and a big old fish, would you say the wolf is violating the fish's rights by eating it? Yes. Okay. If a bear was chasing you, uh, would you justify defending yourself and killing the bear because it's about to yes, eat you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Would you kill the wolf and stop the wolf from eating the fish? So uh, I understand the question you're trying to ask. Um, fish are typically carnivorous and um, aquatic ecosystems can be kind of uh, kind of complex. So but would you would wolf... you defend the would you defend the well, fish's in rights? principle in principle yes but let me explain um, I do believe carnivorous animals should be stopped from violating others rights now when it comes to fish just so people understand my position better um, fish can be like most fish are carn carnivorous so a carnivorous fish that's higher up on the food chain may uh, consume other carnivorous fish that are lower on the food chain so by killing the carnivorous fish that's at the top of the food chain, you may actually end up with a greater degree of rights violations. But in principle, yeah, the idea that another animal killing another animal, yeah, I'd, I'd um, stop the other animal from killing another animal. So you'd kill the wolf from eating the fish in defense deer, of the fish's right, fish's or a rights. Deer to okay. make things more simple. VJ, and can the, you can you turn your mic up just a bit? I'm sorry, you're a, li you're a little bit low. Mic up? Yeah. Sure. Okay, and then if you were to not kill the wolf, but uh, would you do like a cit citizen's arrest? Would you uh, detain the, the wolf? And what would be the process of, um, of a, a, a rights violation for an animal like a wolf? Can you, can you repeat that? Sorry, you if, cut out for oh, me. Oh, sorry. If you, if you intervened with the wolf and the fish, but you didn't kill the wolf, and, and you somehow got it uh, trapped in a net, what would be the process of going through the, the the justice system of rights violations between animals. Well, since uh, animals do not have the level of intelligence that we do, um, it would basically be a similar process to how we might do deal with a human being that's uh, severely mentally disabled if they killed somebody. Um, we could either institutionalize them. Um, so, like, keep a wolf in captivity, feed it, like, vegan dog food. Uh, that would be ideal. If there isn't a system where we could keep a wolf in captivity, and it would just, the only other option is to let it loose and kill other animals, then, yeah, I, I, I'd kill it. Okay, and then, so, if, let's hypothetically say everybody decides to go vegan, would the next logical step would be to fully intervene with animal-to-animal -animal aggression? Um, if there was an interest in doing so, we could, uh, like, again, I'm in favor of killing carnivorous animals in cases where it would, uh, cause a rights violation. And to be clear, I don't think we have any obligation to, uh, prevent rights or sorry, intervene in rights violations. Uh, the only obligation we have is to not violate another creature's rights. And then the when do you determine that creature's rights? I mean, a fish is is pretty low on the. I would say yeah. you would agree on the sentient scale. Is there where does the sentient? Well, can Somewhat you define low, sentience yeah. is for you? Yeah, so sentience is the ability to have a conscious experience and or a subjective how, experience. Okay, and then how do you distinguish that from reactivity to stimuli? Well, uh, again, it's a conscious experience. It's not simply intelligence. Um, Another way to put it would be a subjective experience. Um, well, that well, might... I'm, okay. I'm saying the question is, how do you di distinguish between a, an experience and a, a reactivity to external stimuli? How do you determine, like, logically deduce? Well, how do you, I mean, making the claim that there's a distinction between, um, right. let's say, um, a snail. Well, you touch again, a snail. the distinction, yeah, like, I know, like, yeah, you can cut a blade of grass, it'll release chemicals versus, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, stabbing a fish mm -hmm. um the the way you logically deduce is based on whether you can determine uh whether the creature is having a subjective experience so a blade of grass can release chemicals and intelligently react to stimuli that doesn't mean it's having a subjective experience where it's consciously 
aware of itself, its surroundings, and what and what's happening to it. Kind of uh, like how a computer, like you can send an email, the computer will intelligently react to that email, give you a notification. That doesn't mean that the computer is conscious. Right, but the computer has a mind, and so if you're strict, if you're saying that, intelli- what do you mean by mind? <laughs> well, you're assuming a mind, right? Because the distinction no, actually, mind. yeah, because the dis- you're not, you still haven't made. I'm a not dis- assuming a mind in all cases. What do you mean? Well, you're you're assuming there is a distinction between a mechanism just playing out its chemical activity and an experience which is the thing watching that reaction that that experience that that thing that's occurring so in other words um if i touch something and it reacts and it responds and it like curls up the difference i haven't heard the difference or the distinction between the snail's body or chemicals reacting to the external world and then the experience which is a a qualitative assessment of what just occurred that's a that's a, a it's almost like a post hoc um thought process about the experience it makes a judgment about the experience it makes a future uh um perhaps a okay. future notion of the experience and so i don't but, think you get out of the mechanism I'll, uh, okay um, i'll try to you're... explain this in a way that maybe you can more easily understand um if you were to cut your own finger off um you would feel the experience of your finger being severed. You'd feel the pain. Nerve endings would be, you know, excited and send a signal up to your brain. And then through that whole process in your brain where it it sends signals to the pain receptors and shit, you interpret these things as subjective experiences like pain, shock, What about people who are not born with pain? What about people? What about people who aren't born with the ability to feel pain? Well, then there there will be other experiences uh, related to that. Even people who are born without pain, which is a rare genetic disorder, they still have a um, sense of touch. So they will feel their finger being severed. It's it's just not going to react, uh, result in a pain response. And they'll also be able to see. So you're maybe saying... Hear. So, like, well, let me finish. Let me finish. Um, but if you were to take said severed finger and poke it, yeah, there's cells in there. Um, you might actually, in some cases, be able to get the finger to um, move around and twitch if you prod it with electricity. Uh, you can do that with dead frogs. That doesn't mean the finger itself is experiencing anything just because it reacts to whatever stimuli yeah, you get. Yeah, give that's it. that's exactly what I'm I'm asking. Is that how do you determine the difference between reactivity and thoughtful? Ex- conscious experience. Okay, well, that's that's what I asked you first, whether or not you were asking me to, li- like, how we deduce whether something's intel- uh, intelligent merely or sentient. Um, the w- Like, the easiest way to do that would probably be to ask it if it's sentient. If it's okay. sentient. Um, a human being can certainly answer that question. Um, other animals, because they lack uh, language or an ability to, muni- to communicate, they probably um, won't be able to tell you, but there will be indications at, of sentience. So if you're so if-, if they have a brain, nervous system, similar structures to ours, if they react to uh, noxious stimuli, uh, that's typically a way researchers determine whether or not uh, something is sentient. So if they have these structures and they can react to noxious stimuli and the reaction to that noxious stimuli is uh, similar or identical to the way that we react to noxious stimuli, um, that pretty much uh, deduces that they are sentient. Uh, I mean, we could argue we can't possibly know another mind, but then you could say that same thing about other human beings. I mean, some human beings could just be machines reacting to stimuli and to some degree we are. Uh, like we are just machines reacting to stimuli. It's just that we're it, we're you, assuming that, that other people have. Well, we're we're making an assumption that there are other minds, and I okay. think that's a reasonable assumption to make. Okay, but would you say a mind would then be outside or can't be tied down to just strict physical activity? I have not seen any compelling evidence that there are like souls or spirits or something. No, I didn't say that. I'm just saying if if that's the case, let's say um, if vegan gains, if you really thought you were just kind of like a a wet machine, right, that was in, in constantly reacting to external stimuli and as complex as it might be, 
that even your thoughts and your reasoning and any sort of propositions you make about the external world or your experience would also just necessarily be reactivity. Like it, you, it would just yeah. be the unfolding of a, of a process that's pretty much bound to like the laws of, of well, physics. Well, I'm agnostic as to whether or not um, we have free will or if we're living in a deterministic universe. I think there's a better argument for determinism than... Uh, free will, but I'm agnostic. Well, if determinism was true, uh, the the consequence would be that you wouldn't know it to be the case because any knowledge about it would be impossible because it would be determined. Everything you thought and said would be already a part of a process unfolded. But we're getting. Well, I don't want to get off track of veganism. Yeah, yeah, let's sure. go back to let's get back to sentient. Let, you um, would you say that a, a, like these new robots, you know, the silly ones that like on uh, Jimmy Fallon that talk and. Would no. you say that it might, uh, well, just say like robots that they try to model after human beings. Um, if those became in your um, your parameters, met your parameters for sentient, would you allot light, uh, rights to the robots? Yes. Yeah, so uh, machines don't have a brain, nervous system, no susceptors. Uh, so the way we would determine sentience in a machine might actually be quite a bit different than the way we... Uh, determine sentience in a biological organism because they don't have similar structures. And you can program a machine to act as though it's sentient. You could put sensors on its body, and if you poke it, it could react in a painful but, manner. So okay, it, it, but it really if, entirely depends. I think you'd have to um, determine that on a hardware and code level. Right, but if human beings are in your view just a machine then you really it would be possible completely to model a robot and have them uh fully experience not just pain but the interpretation of pain the uh, preference to not feel pain the preference for pleasure because in your view it would just be a matter of coding um consequences into the system right if possibly this, then that, right um i mean I, I, I'm not like I'm not an AI specialist, but I mean, in theory, it makes logical sense. We could create, say, a simulation that perfectly models like human consciousness or um, I don't know if you've ever played Fallout 4 where they literally make human beings with a 3D printer. Um, like, we, yeah, it's we gotta possible. Thread, we gotta thread the needle back to veganism here. Okay. Yeah, but, um, like, let, let's just, uh, talk about the salient point. Like, what's the moral distinction between humans and animals where you think it's okay to, uh, create a burnt offering of billions of animals, um, so that you can have a burger versus, um, not giving human beings the same treatment? And if we were to find that, um, meaningful trait or set of traits... Mm. Uh, that a human is lacking, that animals also lack, why would you, would you be okay with killing human beings of that nature? Uh, um, no, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't locate a single or even a set of uh, particulars, uh, certainly not properties of nature to um, uh, create sort of like a, a bundle that equals uh, the human and how I value the human. But the problem is with that position that you just offered is that someone could just be amoral and it would still be on you, the vegan, to tell me um, what is it about you as a human being, vegan gains, that gives you um, a moral uh, priority in, in your claims to not eat meat. So if you equalized animals and, and humans, we would still be left asking, well, should, should humans just act more like animals or should well, animals act Well, I already gave like my preference. Right. If it's preference, then it's arbitrary, right? Well, yeah, to some degree, anybody's preferences are going to be arbitrary.